My name is Topher Keen. I am the president of Arizona Kodai, and I am the director of education for the Phoenix Boys Choir. I also teach privately, choirs, musicals, a little bit of everything, and today we're going to be talking about working with struggling singers. Um, we'll touch a little bit on boys changing voices, things like that as well, but mostly this is just for that one or two kid you have in your choir who can't quite match with everybody else. Often they're the most enthusiastic ones we have, um, which is wonderful, but also unfortunate. We wish that the ones who had the solid pitch matching skills were the ones who had as much enthusiasm as the ones who were droning along in the bottom. But there are some things we can do to help these people out. So we're gonna to touch on a little bit of Gordon music learning theory, some very basic stuff there. If you've had training, I promise this will sound like I'm completely bastardizing it, and I apologize for that. But we're gonna get down to the very basics because we only have 50 minutes, and I wanna move through as much as we can. Uh, my framework for working here is I believe that there are about three ca general categories that these students who struggle can fall into. You've got ones who will benefit from a little bit of tweaking into your instruction um, in, in your general music classroom or your choir group setting, and they'll catch on after a little bit of time. You've got ones that need you to really readjust what you're doing in the classroom. They can still get it in the group setting, but it's gonna take a few months of work and some, some additional strategies and techniques from you. And then you've got the ones that really do need the one-on-one -on -one attention. And they exist. And whether you have the time to work with them during lunch or after school or help them get to a good private instructor, that's great. Sometimes you're not gonna be able to do that. So a part of what I wanna give you today is justification when people say, no one's tone deaf, every child can learn to sing. Yes, with the right instruction and the right amount of time. And you don't always, you're not always able to provide that in their given situation, and that's okay. It's okay to accept that some of us only have our students for a few years, and you're not gonna be able to give them all of the skills that you want to give them, ideally, in a perfect world. So we have to work with what we have. I'm gonna give you some stuff that hopefully will help make that a little bit easier, but forgive yourself if it does not always work out because it doesn't ever work out perfectly the way you want it to. And these sessions always sound so wonderful and idealistic and utopian and say, oh well, here's how you work with your students. I don't know if you've had the experience I've had of the experienced doctoral professor in music education who went straight to their master's and straight to their doctoral program and began te teaching in, this, in the colleges and never worked with any actual children and tells you exactly how to handle behavior management problems with seventh grade boys. And you say, yeah, I don't know if that's actually gonna work in my classroom. So hopefully the things that I give you today are going to help. They've been battle tested with dozens of kids. Um, I've worked with se several, several dozen uh, singers who I would classify as struggling pitch matchers. Not full on tone deaf, we'll get to that a little bit later, but struggling pitch matchers and gotten them, gotten them to a place where they can sing well, accurately. They're not gonna be Beyonce, they're not gonna be Justin Bieber, but they're good and they can sing along with the choir and they sound beautiful, they have a good tone and they can contribute. That's, that's the goal is I wanna help you take the kids from zero or one to four or five. The kids who are at a seven or an eight, that's great. They're gonna be fine, you get them to private lessons, like they're wonderful, we love teaching them. But those strugglers at the bottom are the ones we really want. So that's what I'm hoping to give you today, and these are only things I've actually used with real singers and seen work. This is not academics. Um, on that note, if you believe you have a student who this would not help, who's absolutely tone deaf, who you tried everything with, and you can't help them at all, I have an offer for you. If you can get that student on a Skype call with me, I will pay you $500. I have said $100 the first time I gave this talk. It goes up by $100 every time I give this talk. And no one has yet shown me an actual tone deaf person. Who could, not be, who could not be given some semblance of pitch matching skill with a little bit of training. There are people who can't sing yet. There are people who can't sing with a, a decent amount of training. I've never met anyone who's done two or three years of lessons and still couldn't match pitch. So, I, I would say I can't speak Russian. Now, I've never had any training in Russian. I've never read a book in Russian, but I can't speak Russian. That doesn't mean I couldn't learn to speak Russian. I, I would need some help. So if you can find those students, if you have one of them, if it's a family member, if it's a 92-year-old dude, fine, send them to me. 500 bucks in your pocket if I can legitimately not help them match pitch. So let's go ahead and get started with the stuff in your handout. You can pull that out. I'm going to cover a, a little bit of this. This was covered this morning as well in our group session. Uh, the connection between linguistics, the way the brain le learns language, and the way the brain learns music. There's a lot of connections there that we can explore. And then a few things we can hit that um, are separate from the actual ear training element of working with pitch matchers. And then we'll go through the full sequence, which you can see on the next several pages of your handout in the middle. Um, the same way we have a sequence for rhythm, the same way we have a sequence for pitch, the same way we have a sequence for form, we should have a sequence for building essential pitch matching skills. I've worked my hardest to fill in every single gap and make sure I can give you every single step along the way to get someone who can't match pitch at all to being able to accurately sing a cappella in a choir. And hopefully I've hit every step. If you see a gap in my methodology, please send me an email. I'll adjust the handouts and add in your suggestions. 
So we're going to start with an overview of the five sequential language vocabularies that Gordon talks about. Um, unfortunately, uh, Dr. Evan Gordon passed a few years ago. I was able to see him in Massachusetts in one of his last keynote events, and that was uh, this was the methodology he shared with us at that time. And it really changed the way I worked with my students. Because I didn't realize how much I had relied on my personal experiences in music to guide the way I figured my students were experiencing music at home. I had a family that sang in the car and played a lot of music. My, my mom loved musicals. We watched them all the time and we would sing along. She didn't sing very well in tune, but she sang. And we had Disney movies in the house. You know, we, we went to concerts. We had a lot of music in the family, even though I had no musicians in the family aside from myself. Many of our students don't have that experience these days. It's very sad how little music there is in some of our children's classrooms, or some of our students' uh, home lives, rather. Um, and, and it's also sad how little music there is in their classrooms as well. <laughs> a little Freudian slip there. Yeah, yeah, hopefully not the music class. So um, the way uh, Gordon talks about this structure is as uh, almost like a pyramid, that you build out the base of the pyramid and every level above relies on the level below to support it. So at the top level of language learning and music learning, we have writing, being able to take something, a sound in your head, and translate it into something visual. Now I don't distinguish writing as visual notation. Writing is anything oral going into something visual. So if I imagine in my head, Lu, 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 lu. and I show you, I'm writing. I'm taking something oral and translating it into something visual. That is the highest level skill. From there, it's a quick move to the board, maybe write out some letter names, put some circles around the letter names, put some lines through the circles. Oh, now we're writing notation. Great, but you don't need to go that far. If you're getting them to that oral to visual connection, later on, middle school, high school, private lessons, college, they can get that full transition into notation. If they're not matching pitch and keeping a steady beat, there's no real reason to be teaching them to write notation. They're not audiating, they're not producing music, they're just copying out symbols that you've put up on the board. I've worked with so many students who can tell me Tchaikovsky's birthday and where Mozart was born, but can't match pitch. I'm not saying those aren't valuable skills, those are useful pieces of knowledge, but once they have the musical skills, those are useful pieces of knowledge. They're a lot easier to teach. The factual stuff about music is super easy to teach and it's super easy to assess. The pitch matching stuff, steady beat, the essential oral skills are really hard to assess. It's quite tricky. That's not what today's session is about, but seeking out methods of assessment for actual musical skills is key in your classroom. If you find that you are ignoring training those skills in favor of training musical knowledge, it is music class, it is not musician's class. It is music class, it is not about music class. We should be doing music all the time. I don't blame teachers when you have students who get out who don't have those essential skills. It's really hard to teach that, particularly to those individuals who really struggle. However, what I would say is our students have eight years in general music in most situations in most districts. If all of the eighth graders who are graduating in a given district there. If of all the, the students who are graduating in the eighth grade in a given district, 5% of them couldn't add, there might be a problem in the math curriculum. There might be a problem with the math teaching. Many, many schools, it's much higher than 5% who can't match pitch and keep a steady beat after they get out of eighth grade. And if you're getting eight years of instruction in music, what are you getting if you're not getting the foundational skills in music? So we have that highest level, the writing vocabulary. The next below that is the reading vocabulary. You can only write what you can read. Reading is taking those visual symbols and translating them into oral symbols. That can be notation, it can be hand signs, it can be hand staff, which I've fallen in love with a lot recently. It's a lot more flexible than trying to write stuff up on the board. If you'll follow after me real quick, everybody eyes up here. Lu, lu, lu. but that's the foundational basic level skill. And if they're struggling with the more complex skill of decoding multiple staves with clefs and key signatures and accidentals and different note heads, if they're struggling with that, you can make it simpler. At every stage, if there's a struggle with something, think, can I make this job easier? Have I skipped some steps? One of the things I'm most grateful for in my entire career is that I was a pretty terrible musician all the way through high school. I remember what it's like to sing out of tune. I remember what it's like to not know how to cipher. 
I remember what it's like to not know what the note names are. And so when I work with my students and they're struggling, and it was like, oh, well, it's so easy. I remember my first day of sight reading training in college when I sat down and my professor said, bum, sing a major third. What? <laughs> sing a major third. Bum, you're in music school. You know how to sing, sing a major third. I've never, I've never heard of that. I don't know what that means. <laughs> maybe tell me how to do that, that might be helpful. You, you got into music school, didn't you? You should have this skill. Like, we can tell our kids they should have some skills. Sorry, we did, if we didn't give them to them, it's our job to help with those skills. If you get a, a sophomore in high school choir who still can't match pitch and keep steady beat, yeah, they should have gotten that in elementary school, but it's now your job to fix it. And if you can't, then we need some additional strategies. And that's what today is about, so I'm glad you showed up here. So, you can write what you can read, you can read what you can think. This is the one we skip a lot. Thinking is taking musical elements we already understand and working with them in our heads. We're gonna move down the pyramid and then work our way back up. You can only think things that you can repeat. That's the speaking vocabulary. You can only repeat things that you have heard. That's the listening vocabulary. That's the foundation of everything we do. Our students can't do anything with music that hasn't gone in there in some way. Gordon goes all the way to the point of breaking out each individual pitch pair you can get of any combination of solfege and all the keys and using just patterns, throwing them at the students at the beginning of every lesson. activity so that they, he knows for sure all of his students have the patterns in the back of their head before they start. A lot of times we introduce a new song, introduce a new, uh, uh, a new concert piece, <coughs> introduce a new concept, and we haven't even set the stage yet by making sure that they've been exposed to that concept before. One of the things that, that really stuck for me with this was a beautiful, well-produced head tone, particularly in the male voices. For most of us, if, if you're a female teacher, your students may not have ever heard a light, well-produced male head tone in their life. They can get all the way to middle school, high school, and have never heard a man sing, oh, they may never have heard, they might hear some falsetto stuff on the radio if they listen to a lot of pop, but a lot of what they're hearing is just belty chest all day long. If they haven't heard it, if they haven't embodied it, if they haven't had that sound in their listening vocabulary, they're not gonna be able to repeat it. So we're gonna build right up that pyramid with a couple of basic tone sets. Everybody sit up nice and tall. Go ahead and relax your voice. Oh. Thank you very much. And stage one, listening vocabulary. So close your eyes and just listen. Let's get into the key. stage we can start adding on some labels if we want. You want to make sure that the concept is in the brain before you start attaching labels to it. The analogy that made the most sense for me in my Kodai training was if you think about that toy that we all love to play with when we were a kid, that box and all the blocks, and the box has a, has a square hole and a circle hole and a triangle hole, and you have all the different blocks, and you try to shove the triangle block into the circle. As long as you're not able to put the right block in the right hole, you're not ready for the words triangle, circle, square. But the day that you can dump out that box, put it in front of the child, and he grabs the triangle block, looks at it, looks at the triangle hole, and goes, oh, oh, same thing, and puts it in there, he's ready for a label now. He said, this is a concept in my brain. As soon as he grabs it and tries to shove it in the wrong hole, he's saying, the only concept I have is block and hole. I'm not ready to distinguish the blocks yet, because I see them as all just indistinguishable blob of blocks. As soon as he notices that, he's able to put a label on it. Same thing, visually, with colors. You look around the room, we see we have a nice white board over here, we have some pink around the frills over there, we have some red and some blue and some white on our flag over there. The reason we're able to give those labels is because we see them as distinct objects. But most of us might look at this and call it pink, purple, yeah, 
Look over there, that board's mostly pink, that sparkle kind of pink. Back in the back there, that's pink too, the imperfect tense sign on the back of the wall, right? So you don't call those pink. Maybe the back over there, also pink. These are not the same color. They're all very different shades of pink. If we look at the back wall, not the stuff on the wall, but the wall itself, the paint on that wall, what color is that wall? White. I see gray, I see yellow over there, I see some black up in the corner. I see a lot of different colors on that wall. But we're distinguishing at a very surface level. In the beginning when we learn music, we distinguish at a very surface level. High, low. Over time, you can discriminate closer and closer and start getting maybe a major scale, a pentatonic scale. The half steps come later because half steps are harder to distinguish. The chromatic scale comes later because that's harder to distinguish. If any of you have tried those pitch matching tests online, the like how good a musician are you thing, and then they start getting smaller and smaller than a half step and see how fine graded you can hear the differences between the pitches, you'll notice that your hearing starts to go out somewhere around 50 cents to 10 cents, depending on how good of a musician you are in terms of percentages between a half step. Most of us can hear about a quarter step, halfway between a half step, but as it gets smaller than that, it's pretty hard to distinguish which one's higher and lower. You can usually tell when something's out of tune, not always when it's just slightly out of tune, whether it's too high or too low. The more you discriminate, the closer you can get. And this is why we find that in countries where um, a tonal language is spoken, um, in many Eastern uh, countries, there are languages where the pitch is uh, connected to the meaning of the word. In those countries, the rate of perfect pitch is much, much higher because they have something to latch onto and they've heard it ever since youth. It's very rare, it does happen, but it's very rare to find someone with perfect pitch who had no musical training as a child. Often they have piano, violin, some sort of brass, something that's forcing them to listen for those connections. And interestingly enough, if you're raised with a slightly out of tune instrument, I've met people who have perfect pitch and had a slightly out of tune upright piano, they had perfect out of tune pitch. Because oh, no. they learned that's where the connections were. I, I, had, I had a friend in college who was a trumpet player who had perfect pitch on the trumpet and perfect pitch on the piano. You could play 13 notes on the piano and he would name them from bottom to top, but he couldn't sing in tune because they were completely separate skills for him. Oh. Yeah, very interesting, very interesting. So if you know one of those people as well who's in a unique situation, I'd love to meet them because there's not enough research done about it and there's never gonna be enough funding from the NIH to cover researching perfect pitch and singers and all the stuff we wanna learn about. So anyway, we just did our, uh, our listening and our, and our speaking. Um, we can add on labels at that point if we want. Do, re, mi, repeat. Do, re, mi, mi, re, do. Mi, re, do. Do, mi, do. Do, mi, do. And you're all Kodai teachers, so you know the stages in between uh, neutral syllable singing and solfege singing, of getting them to identify their highs and lows, and getting them to identify the same versus different, and then showing that they're ready for those labels. We'll skip over that for now, because I assume you have that. Get up to the higher levels. Now, the thinking vocabulary. This is where it gets a little tricky. This is where we start having some improvisation elements in there, and improvisation terrifies a lot of teachers. And it's the, you notice it's right in the middle of the stages. And most of us have the biggest problem, our, our students can hear us just fine, they can repeat us just fine, we start bringing in reading and writing, and there's a big drop off in ability. It's because that middle section of the pyramid is razor thin. We do one little improvisation lesson every two months and hope that it's enough. It's not. You need to build that stronger than the reading and writing vocabularies. And it can be very simple. All that improvisation means, all that thinking vocabulary means, is taking things you've already repeated and rearranging them in a new way. So say we're learning a language, and I say, the man went to the store. Repeat. The man went to the store. The dog bit the man. The dog bit the man. Can someone raise their hand and make up a new sentence with all the words that you know? All the words you just repeated. Can you make them into a new sentence? Yes, my friend. The dog bit the store. The dog <laughs> bit the store. Ha, ah, what a hilarious, he's an improviser. Wonderful. So, let's take the patterns we know. Do, re, mi, mi, re, do. Do, mi, do. Do, do, do. Four different patterns. Pick two of them and attach them together to make your own pattern. Listen one more time. Do, re, mi, mi, re, do. Do, mi, do. Do, do, do. <laughs> Pick two. Everybody ready? Here we go. Do, re, do, do, re, do. Lovely, you're improvisers. It only takes a few minutes. It, only it can take less than a minute. Uh, but stitching that into your lessons in the place in between listening, repeating, and reading will really help them build up those reading skills. If you can take the elements that you're expecting them to read, break them down into smaller chunks, have them repeat after you, and then play with them 
It doesn't have to be super complex. They don't have to write entirely new patterns. A lot of us jump straight to, okay, we're gonna use the pentatonic scale, four beats, don't repeat my pattern. Do, mi, so, la, and they sing la, 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 because they're so stressed out by all the choices they have that they don't know what to do next. Make it simple. Put the patterns on the board. Here's three or four patterns. Pick one of them. That's a lot simpler than making up a pattern in their head. Now, we still want them to be able to make up the pattern in their head. We want them to be writing full compositions. We want them to be able to fluently improvise within a pentatonic scale and just keep singing throughout the class. That's wonderful. And some of your students will do that on day one. And sometimes you'll have that class that magically picks it up immediately, and you can skip steps. It's okay to skip steps as long as they're not struggling. When you start noticing students struggling, it's probably because you skip steps. What I've seen mostly in my teaching is that music in particular, like math, like language, is a very sequential art. Whether it's the oral skills or the, the physical technique skills, they all build on each other. So you have a base level skill, let's say high and low discrimination, that's 100% accurate. Can you tell me whether I'm singing a high note or a low note? Uh, most students have that on day one. You usually don't have to teach that. So everything above that is going to be some variation of less competent than 100%. And so you get to the next level skill, and oh, that's 90%. So maybe you have you know, whole step motion. So can they tell when it's up or down? Maybe they're, they're pretty accurate, 95%, let's say. Next level skill, 80%. Next level skill, 70%. That's still good enough to keep moving the class forward. If 70% of the class is getting it, you're probably going to move on to the next lesson. 60%, I don't know, maybe I'm going to have to stop and stare for, oh, 50%, okay, we really have to work on this concept. No, you've got to work on these concepts. Because there's still essential skills that go into this skill that are at 70% or 80%. You're not going to get that one above 50. You've got to go back and take that 80%, stretch it out to 100, so you've got a firmer base around your pyramid to sequence your skills on top of it. On top of it. So when you're finding that they struggle with reading and writing, when you're finding they struggle with the higher level pitch scales, when you're finding they struggle with extended improvisation, break it down. Make it really, really simple. One or two notes. I'm going to sing do, re, or re, do. You pick one. And then you say it. That's very, very simple. I know it seems basic. You can do it in 20 seconds. But if you do that, then you can build on top of it. If you keep trying to do the one skill that they're not getting right over and over and over again without building the foundation underneath, they're going to continue to struggle. So, we've done some thinking, some improvisation within our little three-tone tone set. Let's do some reading. Repeat after me first. Do, re, mi, with hands. Do, re, mi. Beautiful. Mi, re, do. Mi, re, do. Good, and we'll skip the other patterns for the sake of time. That's fine. So now read from me. And I would always ask in the beginning to audiate first. I find that that's a lot easier than just immediately reading from the hands as they move. So when I say audiate, for those who aren't familiar with the term, it's the equivalent of visualize. It's creating sounds inside your head. It's the number one skill we're building with our children. Everything we do depends on their ability to make sounds in their head before they make them with their voice. So I'm going to show you a pattern with my hands. You hear it in your head, and then you sing after me. Ready? And say. You can use your hands. Audiate. And the reverse is the writing. You create a pattern inside your head and then produce it out from the pitches. So take one of those patterns inside your head. And can I get a volunteer? Lovely, lovely. So pick some combination of do, re, and mi. It doesn't have to be one of the two we just did, but something we've used so far. Pick some combination and then show it to me with your hands. Do, mi, do. Was that the pattern that you asked about? Wonderful, wonderful. Can I get someone else to give me a different pattern? Yes, Lisa. Do, re, mi, do. Was that your pattern? No. No, so she's listening. You need to sing the patterns wrong, too, because otherwise they're just going to always go, yeah, that was what I did, yeah, yeah. They're just, they're just showing you their hands. Now, trickier level than that. Someone show me a pattern. Who can show me a pattern? Yes, my friend. Lou, lou, lou. Did I sing your pattern? Ooh, see, so there's a little bit of unsureness there. So with the solfege, it's a lot easier. That's a more base level skill. If I sing with solfege and my hand signs, it's really easy for you to know if I'm matching your pattern, right? If I sing on lou, lou, lou and the hand signs, that's still easy, but a little less easy than with the solfege. If I sing just on solfege without the hand signs, it's still a little bit easier, but it's, it's not as easy as with the hand signs. If I go all the way to neutral syllable, now they're struggling for it. This is where we can get that individual assessment on pitch scale. 
I, uh, the research I've done on, on hand sign work, I've not found any conclusive research that hand signs actually help with sight reading. I have some students who tell me they help. I, I like the kinesthetic thing. The research doesn't bear it out. But, but I have some students who, who will use it every single, I have students who use it in all state. We're standing there like sight reading Bach cantatas with their hand signs the whole thing because they just, they love them. But what I love the hand signs for is A, communication with the choir. I can communicate pitch very easily without having to write it on the board. And B, for assessment and dictation. Mm -hmm. So, everybody sing with me. I'll let you take your final notes and then hands up. Do, ready, sing with me. Do, re, mi, re, do. Very nice, very nice. Now I won't sing. You sing from my hands. Use your hands. Lovely. I'm going to expand the tone set so we can play around with it a little bit more. I'm going to sing. You show me with your hand signs what I'm singing. Do, show me with your hands. Re, mi, fa, so, la, lu, 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 lu. Hard mode is with your eyes closed. Do, re, lu. seconds and I can assess around the entire room whether they're uh, accurately audiating, hearing, and dictating from what I'm writing. And then you can have students come up and do their own examples, do their own handwriting. I, I had a wonderful, this, this student in Boston, Emily, uh, sweetest girl, and she joined choir after being a trumpeter for most of her life and really attached to this old thing. She was like, oh, this is so cool. I can understand the music so much better now. And as, as Shelby was saying in the previous session that I was at, um, Solfege nerds are kind of hard to find, so when you find them, you're like, yeah, solfege nerd, cool, let's sign you together. So we were learning, my life flows on in endless song of others' lamentation. How can I keep from singing? And learning, we learned it with hand signed solfege, we learned it on the text, and we sang it as a round. It doesn't work perfectly as a round, but it's good enough. It works fine. And she came in one day, because I had said that in my training in Boston with uh, Pam Wood, I had to do a three-part sight reading, where I had to play one part on the piano, sing one part with my voice, and hand sign the other part. That was how our level two solfege training went in Boston. It was three parts sight reading in three different modalities. She came to me after that day and said, Mr. King, can I show you something? And she goes, Ma, pa, so, do, re, mi, do, re, do, la, so, do, mi, so. She has a three part canon with herself in two hand signs and solfege. Oh. And, she, and it blew me away. I'm standing there like slack jawed, and she finishes out the last phrase and, and holds the pitch while she finishes out the other two. And, uh, and she, She's like, I practiced it all night. Do you think you could do that? And I go, no, I definitely. Maybe I practiced for like 20 days, but why would I practice that? That's crazy. You're insane. You're doing it in the concert. And I, and I had her do it in the concert. I had her do that for the, for the audience and then turn around and conduct the choir in a three-part canon. And it was amazing. It was a really wonderful thing. She just loved it. She latched right onto it. But I would do this sort of work every day. Every day building up those skills and having them. I always say hard motors with your eyes closed. If it gets close to a, to a period ending where I need to do some grading, I might ask everyone to close their eyes. Um, but, but I don't mind having the eye open thing because I find that students want to do, they want to challenge themselves. They want to do really well. They get bored when it's too easy. And they want something that's more challenging. When we have a lot of behavioral challenges with the kids who have skill, it's often because they don't feel challenged. I know because I was that kid. For the entirety of my undergrad, the entirety of my elementary school training, I was always the kid who was boarding class and I acted out and made told jokes and everyone thought I was just a class clown who didn't like to learn, but I loved to learn and I wasn't learning. And that's why I was upset. That's why I was frustrated. So I try to give them harder mode. So one of the things you can do in choir rehearsal, in general music, any of these situations, if you have more than one part going on at once, round a canon or a two or three part piece, say, okay, hard mode is hand sign the alto part while you sing the soprano part. Okay, hard mode in the canon is you sing part one, hand sign part two for me. We can do that very simply right now with a, uh, a simple scale. So let's take, uh, we'll take a comfortable key because it's, I know we're not too warmed up. Let's go up a step. Do, do, mi, so, mi, do. Do, re, mi, fa, so, fa, mi, re, do. Let's just do that far. Everybody together? Do, re, mi, fa, so, fa, mi, Good, with hand signs, ready, say. Do, re, mi, fa, so, fa, mi, re. Harder mode is with your eyes closed so you can't see your friend's hand signs. Ready, and try it. Do, re, mi, fa, so, fa, mi, re. 
Good, and some students will cap out there. Hardest mode is you hand sign their part, they're gonna hand sign your part. Do, re, do, re, mi. Makes sense, we're doing it in the canon. So you start singing. Let's try it with, just, with our hand signs on our part to start, all right? Ready, set. Do, re, mi, re. Now those who wanna try, hand sign the other person's part while you sing your part. Hand sign the other person's part while you sing your part. So you start on hand signs, you start on singing. Ready? Here we go. Do, re, do, re, and there's my overachiever who's already seen the super hard mode, which is hand sign both parts while you're singing one part. That's excellent. And then the highest mode would be the three part canon where you sing one and hand sign in the other two parts. I'm not gonna split you into three parts here. But you can see that's already a struggle for us, right, as teachers? It's not instinctual to be able to do that. And that's hard because when you do that, you may not be audiating both pitches in your head at once, but you're at least audiating two different sets of information. There's two different pathways being used in the brain. The closest I can get to telling whether or not someone is hearing two pitches at once in their head is that sort of skill. It's that and then it's playing a two-part thing or singing. You have a partner up here who's singing with me and have them close their eyes and dictate both parts in hand sign, but that's a really high-level skill. And I, I don't think we, most of us could do that. I can't do it very well, so I don't expect my students to do it. And I, I, there's not a lot of time to do notation-based dictation in the classroom. So that sort of activity is a great scaffolding for those kids who are at the higher level, which, which also need a lot of attention there as well. So moving on from that, like, like I said, kind of put a bow on that, is um, build the listening vocabulary first. Spend a lot of time making sure that they've heard the patterns repeatedly. If there's anything they're struggling with singing for you, repeating after you, or reading from notation, or putting into their right written music, go back a step, go back a step, go back a step. And you probably need more thinking. You probably need more improvisation. A big part of the hand sign stuff can help with that. The breaking down into small patterns and having them repeat can help with that. There's a lot of kind of games and things you can play with Solfege that can help with that as well. And you can use numbers, you can use other systems. There's, there's fine, there's reasons we use Solfege, but it's fine. If you don't have a lot of instructional time, I'm not gonna say that you have to use the system that we use. Um, lovely, so put a bow on that. We're gonna move down. Um, when you have chip singers that have pitch challenges after your sequence is well structured and you are teaching, basic oral literacy skills in the classroom regularly, if you're going through this sequence of stuff and you still have kids who are struggling and not catching on, there's a few things that might be the issue before you assume that it's just a pitch hearing issue. Technique is the first thing you go to. Sometimes it's just a technical issue and they're not seeing right. Do, re, mi, re, do. Oh, you're out of tune, you're always flat all the time, you don't have good ear training. No, they just have a terrible breath cycle. Teach them how to breathe from the diaphragm and support their, their tone, and all of a sudden they'll be magically in tune. Another thing that uh, a lot of us, those of us who, who were trained as singers and have a lot of work with choirs, something that we forget is that the darker your vowel is, often the, the pitch will droop. And so you need to teach them to tune higher when they learn how to open up those vowels. I've had a lot of choirs that'll go from, excuse me, that'll go from, my light flows on in endless song to, my life flows on in endless song. And yeah, they're trying for that big tall tone, but the taller your tone is, automatically the pitch is gonna droop a little bit. So you have to think higher, you have to think brighter, you have to bring a little bit more of the cheeks in there, bring a little bit more of that ringing resonance to get, my life flows on in endless song. But we can forget how that's not very natural, it's not very instinctual if you haven't been singing that way your whole life. You have to hear that modeled a lot. And a lot of times we'll go to the extreme when modeling a tone and say, oh, big open yawning space. Oh, yeah, sing through this space. My life flows on. And they try to sound like you and you're a 29-year-old adult male or whatever you happen to be. And you have a larger tone than a 5-year-old does or a 10-year-old does or a 12-year-old does. So to match your tone, they add artificial weight and space to their sound and it starts going out of tune. Another big thing that can affect that is the vowels. Um, I, there's not enough time here to go into the acoustical physics behind how vowels work, but you are familiar with the term timbre. Timbre is all the things that are not pitch and rhythm and, and volume and all the things that distinguish a note. It's what tells you that an oboe is an oboe and a, a choir is a choir and a piano is a piano. Um, it's also what tells you that different vowels are different and different people's voices are different. The only difference in there is the timbre, which is made up of the overtones above the fundamental pitch. So if I say, a, E, A, O, U. My pitch, my fundamental pitch is the same. The overtones, which is those fractions along the vocal cords that also vibrate instead of just the full length of the chord, it vibrates at the half point, at the third point, the fourth point, the one fifth, the sixth, all the way down. Different ones are being highlighted to make different 
uh, different vowel shapes. And that's what overtone singing is manipulating the instrument into highlighting an overtone so it's louder than the fundamental pitch. I'm not great at it, but I can try. <laughs> So all I'm doing is spiking those, and that's the, uh, the reason why the American R sounds so gross is because it's literally just spiking overtones over the top there. Actually, I have a theory, a working theory. Most of you might be familiar with the overtone sequence and, and know that it goes octave, fifth, next octave, major third, perfect fifth, kind of flat seven, and then all the way up, and get, that's where you get your full scale from. Um, the lowest overtones are that major triad. You have the perfect octave at the doubling, the fifth at the tripling, the, uh, the octave again, the quadrupling, and then the major third at the fifth uh, overtone point. So my working theory as to why minor songs sound sad is because they don't line up with the overtones. When you sing in tune, perfectly in tune and lock it, that major third is still there in the overtone, and it's clashing with the minor third that you're hearing in the chord. It's my theory. And, and whereas a, versus a major triad where everything just lines up in the space of the overtone. Um, it's also why you'll find in, in most well-written music that you see a lot of octaves and fifths in the bass and then a lot of closer tones the higher you go because that lines up with the structure of the overtones from the bottom. Um, so all of that being said, the reason I, I, I give that little uh, side on acoustics is that if you are singing your vowels incorrectly, if your choir doesn't have a consistent vowel space, the overtones might be what's out of tune and that might be what you're hearing. So let's do an example. Everyone sing a nice, healthy, choral, open, ah, ah. Lovely. Give me your best kindergarten. Ah. ah. Good. Give me your best opera. Oh. oh. Lovely. Opera, <laughs> choral, kindergarten. Same pitch. Dead in tune. Don't let the pitch move. Oh. Ah. Sounds out of tune, right? Not out of tune. You're all singing correct, but the vowels are not the same. Now we're making it very obvious here, but a small difference in vowel will make it sound out of tune. Would, would you mind singing with me real quick? Just, ah, oh, ready? Ah, oh. oh. so you hold yours exactly the same. Keep your vowel exactly the same. Ah, oh. yeah, as I move my vowel, you can hear it going more or less out of tune. It's not out of tune, it's vowel matching. Very, very hard to work on. Don't have enough time, that's not what the point of this session is. But if they're out of tune, Think about whether that might be one of the causes, okay? Um, tension in the neck, or registration, head voice, chest voice, getting your voice into falsetto, all those things are, are tied into it. Boys changing voice, as they start going through that transition, the middle notes can often disappear really quickly. A lot of times when you think a boy can't match pitch, they just they have no coordination on those notes. They went to bed with a violin, and they woke up with a cello, and they don't know how to play it anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's the same instrument, you know, it's still strings in your finger, but you gotta stretch them more. And it's hard, it's hard to find. You, most of you probably had those boys in fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grade where their arms and legs grow faster than the rest of their body and they're walking down the hallways with like weirdly long limbs. Yeah, same thing's happening in here. As, I, as was mentioned earlier in one of the other sessions I attended, this, this is a very flexible instrument. It's a wonderful instrument. You know, a, a trumpet doesn't move that much if you try to squish it. A violin, maybe if you stomp on it, you can change its shape. This is made out of meat. Now you wouldn't think to make an instrument out of meat on day one. If we did that lesson we all do in elementary school where you get the tissue box, you put the rubber bands on it, you make your own little instrument. I said, okay, you can make your instrument out of anything you want. Here's some tissue boxes, some paper towel rolls, here's some metal, here's some wood, and here's a pile of meat. What do you want to make your instrument out of? No one picks the meat, but it's the most beautiful instrument you can have because of the flexibility. But it also means it's really easy to damage, it also means it's really hard to master. And it also means that it changes from day to day. And we all know that. You wake up some days and part of your range is not there. You wake up some days and you're in perfect, flawless voice. And sometimes you know why? You know, you went over to a friend's house who has cats and you have allergies and you let it affect you or you didn't turn on your humidifier the night before or you didn't get any sleep because your hotel is next to the highway. So, but your voice can, can highly vary from day to day and so can your singers. As they're going through the voice change, their range might change dramatically from day to day. They might only have three or four notes one day, they might have a full octave the next day, so sometimes those challenges are not um, actually not being able to match pitch. Sometimes it's some other side issue, so I, I, I'd love to cover those. So the, set, the last end here of my session, I want to take you guys through that sequence. Can I get a brave volunteer who's willing to pretend that they sometimes struggle with matching pitch? Who's willing to pretend they can't match pitch? Lovely, my friend. Come on up. Big round of applause for the bravery. Yes, thank you so much. So, from the beginning.
beginning here, we're gonna start going through here, and I just want you to assume that I want you to actually match pitch with me, and I'll tell you when I want you to mess up, okay? Okay. So for now, you can do things accurately. Okay. All right? So looking at that uh, second page on our sequence there, starting with hearing. Basic level skill. You wanna start with the simplest thing and then move up through the sequence until we find something they can't do, then you move back a stage and you work it until you can get to that next stage. So the very base level, like I said, if you have a student who can't do this, I will pay you $500. Get them on a Skype call with me, prove it to me. I'm happy, happy to do it. I've been asking for several years and no one's taking me up. So, high and low. Can you just tell me if I'm making a high sound or a low sound? Ah! Uh, high. Uh, Wonderful, she's not tone deaf. If you were actually tone deaf, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between a male or female voice. You wouldn't be able to tell the difference between a statement and a question. Pitch is the only difference there. An actual tone, and they do exist, so some very small percentage of the population, they do exist, I haven't met them, but they exist, probably not in your classroom, but they exist. Shy of a mental or physical disability. They're, they're, I, had, I was talking to someone yesterday who has a student who's 75% deaf and doesn't wear hearing aids to class and still loves singing in choir and wants music to be part of their life. So. That's a different box than we're dealing with right now. So when you're dealing with disabilities, put that in a separate box. But in the general population, I've not run into someone who can't do that on day one. So then you move through the sequence. Can they identify large pitch motion? Can you tell me if I'm going up or down? Oh! Hi. Oh! Down. Yeah, so she's using high and low. That's fine. Use her words. It's harder to use the words I tell her to use. Some of our students, we were talking about this in the car on the way over here. Some of our students, when we first say high and low, think that it means volume. When you hear up and down, that means volume, because they'll say, turn that down. It doesn't mean lower the pitch on your stereo. It means lower the volume. So they need, we need to use their words at start and then tell them, okay, when you use that word, here's the word that musicians use. Can we try using the musical word? Up and down. Great. Can you identify small pitch motion? That's harder than large pitch motion. So still, up or down. Uh, 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 down. Uh, down. Lovely. Can you identify same? This is something we really need to work in so many of us, again, like the improvisation, like the listening vocabulary. We neglect to teach whether something is the same pitch or not. Um, same patterns we often hit, but same pitch. Because when you're sight reading, and most of you can, can echo this the same, when you sight read, often a repeated pitch is really hard. Because you're so used to moving along the pattern, and then you see two so's in a row, and you skip right over it and jump to the next note. Happens all the time, happens to all my singers. And you might have had this experience of that little joke that you mean that goes around online, the little paragraph that says, all the words in this sentence have the word the repeated twice, and you look back and there's the, 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 but you missed it because your brain just skips right over it. Yeah, it's because your brain has already seen that. It goes, okay, I, I don't need this, this is superfluous information, I just need the one, that's fine. And it, you literally ignore it, you don't even notice it. Same thing happens when you read. Unless you've been trained that same repeated pitches are difficult and something you need to pay attention to, your brain is going to say, I've already seen this, I don't need to see it again, I already sang the so. But, but it's so, 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 you know, but it just, I saw the so, it's fine, we'll go on to five. That's, I, I can save my time, I'm going to go over here. So pitch consistency, can you tell me whether it's up, down, or same? And, and, and the, the first skill would be, is it same or different, as we all know. But I'm going to skip a step so we can get through everything today. Uh, up. Uh, uh, down. Uh, uh. Um, so the hearing set is the easiest set. If there's anything that's a struggle there, if you need to spend a lot more time with listening activities, move to music, free dance, sing and repeat, lots of very basic stuff with them. So that they're getting more, that, that, that's what that's mostly telling you is that that student has no music in normal, most likely. Or, they, or when they do, they're not paying attention to it. Um, producing. Producing something without, a lot of us jump straight to repeating, but producing on your own is easier than producing after someone does something else. Now producing accurately on your own is harder than repeating after someone else. But just producing a sound without something before it is much easier than trying to match a sound that you just heard. So, can you make a variety of high and low sounds? Can you make me a high sound? Can you make me a low sound? Can you make me a medium sound? <laughs> nice, I like it, I like it. And you can do animal calls, meows, owls, all the dogs, all those sort of things. Big dog, little tiny dog. Good, you know, all that sort of stuff is very helpful. Large pitch motion, can you move from bottom to top? Can you move from top to bottom? Now that we have that, we know we can use that when she's off pitch. I can use the symbol and say, when I do this, can you go from bottom to top? Whoa. Good. Can you go from top to bottom when I do this? Oh. Lovely. Lucinda? So what about when you get a student that they'll do that, but they're stuck down there? Like, oh. Yep. You know? So a part of that is a part of that might be a range issue. There, there are some, it depends on how old the boy is. There are some boys who just, there, there's a gap in the middle of their voice, and it is not, they're not going to produce pitches there. I mean, like second grade. Yeah, that, that is less, that's less common to be a physiological issue. Um, a big part of that is, I would say, more singing games, 
more, more activities, more, um, any songs you can do that have like barnyard animal sounds, stuff like that. Get them to imitate, you know, cat sounds, dog sounds, owls, um, silly voices. That'll usually get them out of the like, I'm trying to sing a pitch thing. And that might take months. It might take a long time. This sort of sequence, I would only use in a one-on-one -on -one situation. There's no space for this in the classroom. As I said, the other things from the beginning of the workshop are the things I would do in a classroom set. At a certain point, you might have the students who aren't responding to the classroom stuff. Lunch, after school, separate private teacher if you can. If you can't do that, forgive yourself. It's okay. Keep doing the classroom stuff. Maybe they'll get there by the end of the year. Maybe they won't, and that's okay, because not everyone does. It's all right. Um, so we'll skip through the rest of that. Can you, can you produce uh, different pitches? And then the first thing you want to do when you're working with a student privately is make sure you match their pitch. So can you produce a pitch that's just sort of in your middle range and just hold it out nice and long? Lovely. Wonderful. I'm going to match your pitch. Can you just hold on to your pitch nice and strong? Lovely. And sometimes they'll play follow the leader unintentionally and start running away from you. And you got to catch them. And that's OK. I had that student who, would, who I could never match with her. Uh, Becky, sweetest girl in Boston. She would move all around as soon as I started singing with her, but she could hold a pitch if I wasn't singing. And she'd move and move and move, and then I would chase her down, and she'd get down to her lowest note. Okay, stay there, I got you. You can't, can't go any lower, right no. there, hold it. Uh, okay, we got it, we got it. I said, what does it feel like when we sing in tune? Everybody, can you join me on ah, ah. Who can describe the feeling when you're singing a note next to a lot of people who are singing the same note? What does it feel like in your body, in your face, in your ears? Oh. Oh. I see something from Lucinda. What word? It feels expansive. Expansive. Lovely word. Love that. Who else has a different word? Unity. Unity. I like that word too. Who else has a different word? It feels like you're clicking Legos together. Clicking Legos together. Wonderful. I had someone who said it feels like a unicorn horn poking out of my <laughs> forehead. Like, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Got it, Phil. That's great. Go for the unicorn horn. And so I said that to Ben. She said it was a warm, fuzzy feeling. I said, yeah, so that warm, fuzzy feeling, what, what did that feel like? She goes, well, that's what means you're out of tune, right? Like, that's what, what it feels like when you sing flat. I learned that four semesters into choir with Becky, that she thought the in-tune feeling was the out-of-tune feeling. That's something you need to check for, because sometimes you go for 18 months with that singer who can't match pitch, and it's, it's as simple, it wasn't as simple as that. It's not like that day, magically, everything was perfect. Chase that feeling. But chase that feeling, and in a few months, it was a lot better, because you started seeking out that feeling. So you need to find the words for you, because we say sing in tune. They don't know what that means. In tune doesn't mean a thing to a kid. They often pick it up. Most of our students pick it up automatically just from the context of class. This is not about most students. This is about that bottom 5% who don't pick it up on their own. Find their words. Use their words. When you're in class and they're struggling and they're not quite matching, you go over and say, hey, do you feel that expansive, the thing we talked about, the expansive feeling, you said, do, do you feel that expansive? Do you feel that right now? No, I don't feel, okay, let's chase that. Let's try to find that. Can you find that expanse with me again? Good. Can we find the Legos? Are the Legos clicking or are they sitting, oh yeah, they're sitting in a pile, Mr. Dean, the Legos aren't clicking. Okay, well, let's try to click those Legos. Let's get them. And as soon as you start using their words, it makes it a lot easier for them. Now, you need to eventually transition that into real musicianship vocabulary, but their words are going to help. Um, thank you very much. And then identifying, matching with us or not, use physical motions to move them around. They need to build that slide first, like Lucinda said. If you've got a student who's just sliding in two or three pitches, you can build up some pitch matching skill within that small range, but you're gonna to need to go all the way back to producing high and low sounds, maybe just those animal sounds, before you're gonna get them to be able to move up to your pitch. If this is my pitch, and all they're able to do is, oh, then you can't match up here. You gotta match down there for a while until they expand, and you gotta go back a few steps. You can't just keep pounding at that level of the pyramid and expect it to get bigger. Eventually, it's just gonna to topple over. You need to build out the levels below. If you flip over to the second page, Can they follow me? So I want you to produce a pitch, I'm gonna match your pitch, and then I'm gonna move away. Can you follow my pitch when I move away? So make a pitch. Oh. Good, she's very accomplished, so she's moving quite quickly, but normally it'll take them a little bit to find it. You might give them a little physical cue to bring it back in. And then you can use those cues in class as well. You make a little eye contact and a little, you know, and they're, oh yeah, okay, yeah, no, I remember, okay, great, and they're there. Now it takes time, that's not gonna happen on day one. She's a very bright student and moving very quickly. We've gotten over halfway through the sequence in about two minutes, so. Anyway, um, I'm, I'm uh, running up against my time, so I apologize, we're not gonna get through that second end there, but you do see that we go all the way through matching to what I'm doing, which doesn't come to almost the very end, because it's a very hard skill to hear my pitch and match my pitch. And the very bottom, hearing patterns and repeating them. Repeating patterns is harder than repeating single pitches. So at every stage, think, what I'm doing, if my students are struggling, can I make this simpler for them? 
can I make this easier? Can we get a quick round of applause for our volunteers? Thank you so much. Can I ask, what's yeah. the difference on four between the first bullet point and the second bullet Can they follow my directions to move their pitch up and down physically? So can you sing a pitch for me? Uh, That's step one. Uh, okay. Step two is can you follow when my pitch moves? So Matt, sing your pitch again. That's harder. Okay, matching okay. my voice is harder than matching my hand. Okay. Um, so the last thing I just want to tell you before we close out, again, you have that chapter from my book if you'd like to check that out. Um, I, I will be doing the choral reading session later. I hope that you'll be there as well. Um, I'll leave out my business cards. If you have any questions, if you'd like to get on a Skype call and chat about your classroom, I'm happy to do that. Email, phone, and website is there. I also have a newsletter on my website you can sign up for so you can learn about different concerts and events I'm doing if you want to catch me at a different conference. I do have some old conference talks from other events that are out there on YouTube as well if you'd like more information there as well. Um, and I'd like to put all this in a little box because we do these sessions to learn new techniques and strategies to bring back to our classroom. But at the end of the day, the techniques and the strategies aren't what it's about. It's about making sure that we're making beautiful musicians and helping kids learn to express themselves. I had a lot of options for careers. Could have gone into law, could have gone into psychology, could have gone into math. I taught AP Calc while I was in high school. I took the SAT seven times for fun. I, music was not my, I, I like music, but it was fun. I, I went into music, um, many of you have heard that statement that more people are afraid of public speaking than afraid of death. Right? More people are afraid of singing than public speaking, I'll tell you. I promise you give them the chance, they'll take the speech over the solo any day. I've had elementary choirs on stage and turned to the audience and said, how many of you parents in the audience would change places with your students right now and sing up here? You get the three or four stage moms, but aside from that, most of them will not do it. Say, what about for $1,000? How many of you would come up here? More hands, but not all of them. How about for $10,000? More hands, not all of them. There are people who you could pay 10 grand and would not get up and sing at an elementary school choir concert. That's how scary what we do is. And we get 10 year olds to do it. And if they can do that, when they have to ask for a raise, when they're interviewing for a job, when they're applying to colleges, when they're asking someone to marry them, when they're asking someone to prom, it's not quite as scary as getting up in front of 100 or 200 or 1,000 people and using your voice. What we do really matters. And you never know when someone's singing next to you, when someone's singing in your choir, when you yourself, when someone in your audience really needs music that day. And especially if you have more than 10 people in a room, there's a really good chance someone's having a really terrible day. If you have 30 or 40 kids in your room and your kids are relatively young, there's a good chance one of those kids is having the worst day of their life right now. Because their lives aren't very long. <laughs> Chances that it's one of the worst is pretty good. Some of them have parents going through a divorce. Some of them just got a rough diagnosis. Some of them just learned that they failed all their classes and they're coming to music and it's the only place they feel like they can kind of do something right. So what we do really matters. Sing from your heart. Make them sing something beautiful. Make music. Thank you for what you do. Love you guys.